This is a, this is a, I mean, this doesn't just come to anybody, you know, and do you, do, you, do you go after it or do they come after you? Talk a little bit about that. Sure. Uh, the script came to me uh, from the casting director uh, who sent it over to me, asked me to take a look at it and uh, provide my thoughts. I read it. I thought it was an amazing story. I had never heard this story before. And like so many others, as I've met along the way since then, are familiar with the story since they were young. That was not my case. But I read it and I thought, wow, what an amazing story of love and forgiveness and transformation. I really want to be a part of it. Um, it's different than anything I've done in a long time. I went in to meet the producers. And I found out that, I, that you know, the script was not only this amazing story, but I was playing two characters. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, which for an actor, that's just a dream come true. And they were shooting three months in Panama, uh, in the jungles. And that just appeals to every sensibility that I have. And I said, I have to be this. So I literally marched into the producer's office and said, OK, guys. I'm going with you to Panama. I said, I don't care if I'm going to be cleaning up uh, after you guys or doing craft services, or you can give me the parts to act in, but I'm going to make this movie. And the producer nodded, and he said, yeah, I think you are. So uh, that was how, this, how it went. It's just been an incredible journey since. I love this film. I think it's come together really well, and I'm very proud of it. You're playing a real person who's standing next to you as you're shooting the film. We'll talk about that. Yeah, I'm playing two real people, one who's passed and, and, and has since become kind of a legend and a hero, a bit larger than life, important to so many people, as I would come to find out. And then his son, Steve Saint, who, as you said, is involved in the film and standing literally 10 feet away on most of the scenes that we're shooting. And that was at first exciting and then terrifying. You know, uh, it, it was a huge responsibility to bring these men to life and bring their humanness to it. You know, everybody, of course, wants to talk about the amazing things about both of these men, but I need to find out the, the real stuff, too, the humanness. Where were their fears? Where were their egos? Where, you know, that was my challenge, and I, and I, uh, I, I hope that uh, I did a good job with that. I feel pretty good about it. There's a goofy quality to them when they're together. Talk about that. When, uh, Oh yeah, though they were, and they were. You know, you watch what little tape there is of those guys, and they were, they were frat brothers hanging out. I mean, they were, you know, just because their mission was one of God and of, of Christianity doesn't take away from the fact that they were young guys, full of youth and, and passion and drive and, and and craziness. And I think at times, you know, blinded by uh, their desires and blinded by their passions uh, at times. And um, they were fun. You know, Jim Elliott was a it was crazy and fun and that actor um, Sean uh, McGowan and I have s since become best of friends and he was uh, really important to me as we made this film we got very close the murder is an ambush that comes out of nowhere. yeah yeah it's an ambush that comes out of nowhere as a matter of fact I believe that the missionaries probably at that time and this is what makes it so heartbreaking really believed they had succeeded you know and really believed, you know, they spent 13 weeks dropping gifts, and they really thought by, at this time that the signs coming back for the tribe were certainly ones of friendship. There was so much that they couldn't comprehend about the difference in culture. Um, so when those spears came, I had to believe that it was shock, and I have to believe there had to be that moment, you know, for Nate and the other uh, missionaries where they went, what happened? I thought, I thought this was the plan, and I think... It was the plan. They just didn't know that their role in it was going to be to die that day, you know. And uh, now it's amazing to look. You know, I often say this movie reminds me of, of uh, the story reminds me of when you look at a book so close that you can only make out lines. You can't, and then as you pull it back, you can see their letters that make up words, that make up sentences, that make up pages, that make up a book, you know. And... And that's the way I see it, this story, just as you keep pulling back and it keeps revealing what it has to offer so many people, Christian, non-Christian, you know, uh, across the religious divide or their political divide. I think that there's a story of love and, and transformation, and that's for everybody. Talk about the, you're an openly yeah. gay actor. Talk about the Christian yeah. side of it. I, at first, when I was confronted with it, I was going, this yeah. is a very odd Well, I have to say, when I was offered the role, and I found out who the filmmakers were and what their goal was with this company and who, uh, how important this story was to so many conservative Christians. I thought, do they know who they're talking to? You know, and that was my bias. You know, that was my preconceived notion that surely they must not, they must know that we're not playing on the same team, you know. And that's just from 
the years of hurt and things that have come my way, of assuming that, you know, certainly. And I went in there because it's the way I am. I marched back into that office. I said to my manager, set up a meeting with the director, and I need to talk to these guys, make sure. One, I need to make sure that there wasn't any money that was being made off this movie that was going to hurt somebody like me. Um, I had just nightmares about finding out that down the line that something that I did contributed to, you know, hurting my community in some way. So I addressed that, and I said, I went in there, and I said, look, I just need to talk to you. I understand here, you need to know who I am, and this is what I believe. And they pulled out the advocate before I could even finish my sentence. The second cover that I'd ever done for the advocate, and it contained a lot of me talking about my spiritual beliefs. And they said, we know. We took this to Steve Saint in the jungles of Ecuador. We gave it to him. We told him that this was the man that we believed was right to play him and his father in the movie. But this is... Uh, Oh, he's openly gay, and these are the things that he talks about. Steve read that interview. He said the same things that I talk about in that interview, the same things that he spoke about in his lifetime, and it would be wrong uh, not to allow me to do this movie. And uh, we subsequently made a pact together uh, that we would walk together in the making of this movie and, and in the present presentation of this film. And if nothing else would come from this film, we would show that these two supposed individuals on opposite ends of different camps could walk together, we would work together, and we would love each other, and we do. When we left the making of that movie, Steve and I were both in tears and hugging each other, and I, was, and I knew it was because I was going to miss him, and I loved him. My preconceived notions were wiped away. So were his, I think, in many ways. In fact, we sent letters to each other um, which addressed that issue. And, um, and the fact of the matter is, I consider myself a Christian. I consider myself... Um, uh, deeply Christian. I also consider myself to be spiritual in ways that surpass any confined definition of that. My relationship with my higher power is deeply personal. It encompasses many of the same beliefs of these people and also uh, beliefs that aren't the same as these individuals. But we walk together, we work together, we respect each other, and we love each other, which is what this movie's about. Let's, uh, talk about what's the hardest thing to shoot for you, for you the scene? Uh, the spearing was extraordinarily difficult, but it, it um, emotionally it was very difficult. Just coming up with that level, but by far the most difficult. And so much of it actually didn't make the final cut, but we made a movie that's well over three hours long. A lot of the film that you don't see is the stuff with Steve Saint towards the end and his struggle to stay with the tribe, to help the tribe learn to take care of themselves, fighting with local political governments and uh, teachers and the Ecuadorian people uh, on behalf of this tribe. But in, in that segment of the film, I spoke entirely in Embera, the language of the tribe of Panama with whom we shot the film. And it was extraordinarily difficult, if you can imagine for a second, doing a scene with another actor. As he speaks gibberish to you, you have to memorize his lines from the script so you know what he's saying to you. Have the appropriate emotional response and then respond in a memorized gibberish, which means nothing to you, but also knowing what it is you're saying so you can have the appropriate, you know, is difficult. So every night we'd work 12, 14 hour days. I'd go home from the jungles dirty and put this ridiculous tape recorder to my ear where John, a beautiful missionary from, uh, also from Ecuador, had recorded lines of Embara on it and I would desperately trying to put these words which meant nothing in my head and so that I could say them the next day. It was hard. Very hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I think now when you watch the final end of the movie, there's one or two scenes where I speak the Ambada and I'm like, oh, you guys. Oh, well. Let's go back with you. Uh, I wanted to ask you, you have this amazing television career and you get started. Uh, I, I talked to Macaulay Calkin last year and that was a great privilege and he's gone through the same journey that you've gone through. Child actor, amazing star, and now going and transitioning to adult roles and the difficulty and dropping out for a while too. Let's talk a little bit, uh, first of all, what's your family like and how do you, how do you wind up in, in show business in the first place? My family's not showbiz. They're not Hollywood by any stretch. For me, it was it was purely you can call it an accident or an act of God, whatever your belief. But I uh, I know that um, <laughs> I was out five years old. My twin sister and I were brought up on the stage at county fairs in in written the most look alike a boy and girl contest, and um, it was silly. We were little kids. We were matching clothes. We we're twins, and 
people came up to my mother afterwards and said, your kids are so cute, they really should be in commercials. Da -da -da -da. Here's your phone number, agency, so on and so forth. W my parents didn't know what they were doing. They heard that we could probably get some money saved for college and maybe it would be a good, good thing. We didn't come from a lot of money. And, um, and that's the way it began. Uh, it took off for me relatively quickly. I did a commercial first for McDonald's and then uh, took off with uh, a couple of television series and so on and so forth. But my family, um, specifically to answer your question, is uh, I come from what I call the great American dysfunctional family. And what that means is not anything horrific at all. It just means that they're, they, we, they're an incredibly loving family. I grew up with a Catholic background. Uh, I wouldn't say that my father was great at, at expressing emotion or learning how to do that, you know, um, but I knew that I was loved. I, I, there was never a time when I didn't know that I was loved. My family, I think in, in many ways we, we grew up a lot together, you know, as my sister and I reached young adulthood and went through our fair share of difficulties and stuff, my parents really, we all stuck together and we did whatever it took and so many of us kind of grew up together and a lot of healing came in, into our family over the years and that was like a domino effect. And um, I really enjoy spending time with them now. Um, yeah, Paul was funny. He was he just plain funny. He was a fantastic guy. Uh, I I he was very welcoming. That was show it was a hard show to do. It wasn't. Um, they they weren't the friendliest bunch to be perfectly honest. It was difficult. They were. It was hard. I mean, I remember many times Stacy Keenan crying and Vonnie and us. You know, because note sessions were so difficult and strenuous, and the show was never a huge hit, but it was always kind of stumbling along and hoping. To, you know, and Paul was just really a wonderful person. He was really giving and and so funny. He could. I just remember watching him like in between scenes and watching him make jokes and tell, and and he was brilliant at it. You know, he used to come out. I don't know why I remember this so distinctly, but it's one of my favorite memories. He'd come out and he'd always go, and he'd be petting around and he'd go, where, where are my testicles? I knew I had them somewhere. Where are my testicles? I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> I get the impression following your career that uh, growing up in TV, in a sense, that, 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 that all these TV families, uh, it's a little more than just uh, happenstance, that there's some surrogate family stuff going on, St. Elsewhere, My Two Dads, later Dr. Quinn Medicine uh, Woman. I mean, there's a little part of your growing up and a little part of is really with these people in some odd way. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Uh, in a very large way, you know, my television families over the years have played important roles to my growing up. You know, um, you can't spend that much time. You know, my first series was St. Elsewhere. I was eight years old. I did the series for four years. I was recurring, but I was there quite a bit. And, uh, you know, um, I remember this. I can remember today what it, what it smelled like to be held by Ed Flanders, you know. And he was, would hold me in his arms. You know, I can remember um, shooting um, Our House. Deidre Hall became very much a surrogate mother to me. She would take me home on, on a lot of, of nights and we would bake cookies together. And, you know, she named her firstborn son David after the character that I played on Our House because that relationship was so important to her. You know, it's something that I always cherish, you know. Um, my siblings on Dr. Quinn Medicine Woman were without a doubt, you know, it was my opportunity to give back. Uh, you know, I grew up in, in studio schools and so on and so forth, you know, on sets, and it was my chance, finally, I was old enough, the big brother, to really be the big brother and give back and make sure the kids were having fun in their school trailer. You know, so, yeah, absolutely, you become a family. And then the amazing thing is, it sometimes goes away as quickly as it came, you know. Most of these people I've just mentioned to you, I don't speak with anymore. Maybe if we happen, if we happen to run into each other or something happens, we will, but we don't have an ongoing relationship. And that's just the way that it is. And it never fails me. Every movie that I do, even today, you know, we're so close. And you, you do it every time. You swear, we're going to stay in touch and with this, and I'll see you. I probably, and you really mean it. And then you're on to the next thing. And it's not a bad thing. It's certainly not, it doesn't. It's not doesn't undignify the love that you have, the relationship you have, but it's for that period. You know. Talk a little bit uh, about being outed at 22, and and it's a brutal experience. I mean, the whole paparazzi and all the other things. Talk a little bit about that. What happened and how it affected you? Yeah, it was um, being outed was a, it was a scary experience. Uh, you know, the bottom line was when it happened. 
uh, I was not ready to talk about my sexuality in public. It wasn't something I didn't even know if for sure if it was something that was going to stick around. You know, I, I was young and I was um, I wasn't ready, and it was frightening. It was like somebody coming to you and saying, you know. I'm going to take your dreams away from you and you can no longer have these things because I was told point blank you'll never act again if you do if you come out if you're public about this it won't you know it can't happen so it frightened me you know not to mention being at that age stuck in a room full of network executives producers managers agents publicists lawyers um, and network people talking about your sexuality and then all you know, crowded in this room with you in the middle going so what are you what are what do you want to do? Do you want us to get you a girlfriend? We can do that. You know, do you want us to, do you want to be on the cover of a gay magazine? We can do that. You just have to tell us and we'll support you. So it wasn't that they were unsupportive. It was just, it was all too much. You know, I wasn't ready for that. And I knew the best piece of advice that I'd been given single-handedly, and I say this all the time, was that I would not talk about it publicly until it was good news. And it was not good news then. It was good news when I was... 26, give or take, and I made the decision to come out publicly, knowing then that I no longer cared if uh, I never acted again. It was worth it to me that there were too many kids out there uh, too distraught over their sexuality and needing people to look up to and needing to just hear some stories, you know, told, to open that gate, that it was, w it was worth it. The fact of the matter is my career has been more interesting and exciting to me than it ever has been since I came out. Um, I love the work that I do speaking and sharing around the country about my experience coming out as a gay man as much as I love acting as part of who I am and uh, the political work that I do as well. And, uh, okay. That's interesting. Oh yeah, I did. Um, I've done a lot of indie films. It's been a lot of fun. I love the independent film world, and now I'm having the opportunity for the first time to produce um, with my new company, Myth Garden. But um, yeah, I've done, uh, we did a, a film there in Texas, West Texas, for a bunch of months called uh, 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 The End of This Period of This Movie. That movie was called What Matters Most. Um, and that was a blast. It was a wonderful film to be a part of because the woman who directed that picture was dying of cancer, and it was her dream to make this film she'd worked on for many, many, many years. And her dream came true, and we were all part of that, and she didn't live too much longer after we finished the making of that film. So I'm very proud to be a part of that story. Um, you know, I've done <laughs> so many ones. It's funny, uh, it's one of the fun things about doing these kinds of interviews is people generally bring up the stuff that I've plain forgotten about, but there's been, you know, so many, I've played more killers and drug addicts and mentally ill people than I have, uh, than I have, uh, you know, good guys uh, on TV, but um, I enjoy what it. What do you think gets people cast in those roles? So, so, I, I, I don't know. For example, I noticed that Jonathan Reyes Myers, who's just making a hit in, in Woody Allen's Match Point, has played a series, he played an assassin in Michael Collins. He plays this southern bushwhacker who tries to kill Tobey Maguire and, and ride with the devil. You get nothing but those roles and suddenly people see you some other way. I don't know, it's odd for me because I made, the bulk of my career was in television playing, you know, the boy next door, and nice guys, you know, my two dads is our house, I mean, St. Louis where I was, you know, autistic, but uh, somewhere in there, I also began playing a lot of killers, and I've done, I've done, you know, I've done a lot of them, from uh, the Helen Hunt film to the, uh, the, uh, and the picture with um, that I just did with uh, for Lifetime, the Charlie's Angels. And there's so many of them, but uh, they're. Um, I don't. Somebody said there's something about my eyes that get, get that can get a little creepy. So I don't know if that's it. You know, yeah. There's just a, a very like an intensity that comes and, um, you know, I've I've done a, a fair share of uh, psycho killers in television, especially in guest spots and a couple NYPD blue killers and yeah. So I'm really a nice guy though. <laughs> Yeah, it's a blast. Um, I'm really happy about this series. It's called, uh, well, the first one was called Third Man Out. It's actually called the Donald Strachey Mysteries. And they are essentially a Columbo-like series of TV movies for the HERE network, uh, Paul Collegeman's HERE TV. And we're doing six movies based upon the series of books. 
Um, Donald Strachey is, is, is a classic, kind of hard-boiled, doesn't really get along well with most people, very klutzy, kind of, kind of me very messy, good detective who happens to be gay. So it's got all the classic elements, but when he comes home at night, he goes home to his long-term monogamous love of his life, who's a man instead of a woman. And um, it's been a lot of fun. We did one film so far. We are slated to do two more starting next month, February of 2006. Uh, and then I'm going on to produce and star in the film Save Me, which is a project that is very dear to my heart. It's a movie I've been trying to get off the ground for two and a half years now. It is uh, starring Judith Light and Robert Gant, who's my producing partner. And uh, it's, it's a true story about a, um, excuse me, it is based upon actual events. The writer went and lived in a Christian ex-gay ministry. And it's a love story. And it's a beautiful love story. And it's a love story that doesn't demean anybody. It's a love story that uh, focuses on, again, you know, the Christian community and the gay community without making anybody the bad guy, without making anybody rubes or dumb, which is what I think the mistake that's so often done in, the, in a number of our films that try and tackle this relationship. Um, it shows, in, in relationship to the gay community, it shows what the things that I learned by making End of the Spear, which was I assumed that right-wing, hardcore Christians who were speaking out against members of the gay community must be bad or evil, you know, because the effects of their words were so hard, were so hurtful. And what I discovered as I made this, that there are those individuals who have hate and they have fear in their hearts, and that's what comes out. The vast majority, I believe, are doing what they believe the most loving thing to do is. Um, and so it's time we just have a conversation about love and allow us the freedom to do that. And I think that that's what Save Me does. And I think it will have the power to bring all of us together uh, in love. And uh, Has that been financed? Yeah, yeah, it's been financed. Um, in fact, we just closed the finance deal a few weeks ago. We have set a May 9th start of production date for it, and uh, and we should be shooting in New Mexico. Final question: What do you think the Brokeback Mountain phenomenon now seems that if gay pictures could be greenlighted with a little money behind them? Mm. Well, I think it's, of course, I think it's fantastic. I think that, you know, the bottom line is good stories should be able to be told, whether they're good stories about straight people or gay people or whatever it is, you know, they should have the opportunity. And until now, the fact is we haven't been able to tell those stories, not in the way that we want to, not, you know, to reach an audience the size of which we want to reach. And, you know, not because of recruiting or any of these things that people will put out there in their minds, but simply because they're great stories. You know, Ang Lee said that when he made Brokeback Mountain, it had just gotten so difficult to tell a love story anymore because it's been told every way to Sunday. There are very few new angles you can look at a great love story, and this was one of them. So he wanted to tell it. I love that. Um, you broke back mountain is a great story with amazing characters and a great through line, and it's a beautiful, simple tale. That's what I love about film. You know, I watched that movie three times, and I, I couldn't wait to put my arms around the original writer of that story and say thank you. Um, it's a fantastic opportunity. You know, the fact is, most of our stories have been relegated to art house theaters and, and being told in a very small way. We hope to finally, and one of, my, one of the goals I have with my company, Myth Garden, is to finally turn the page on gay and lesbian storytelling uh, and do it in a way that we haven't been able to do yet. You know, whether that's at the million dollar level or the 20 million dollar level or the 50 million dollar level, to really tell those stories well. And they're not just gay stories, they're great stories with gay characters. Well, boy, that would be a great, you know, that movie, everybody's tried to make it. It's a difficult tale. It's a, it's a large budget picture. I've been myself, had my hands on it a couple of times. It's going to require a lot of money and the right stars and the right director, but I hope it gets made because it's just too good not to. Congratulations. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you.